Welcome back to the Moving Beyond Earth Gallery at the National Air and Space Museum. During the second part of our program, we're going to hear from the crew of the STS-132 mission. They recently returned from a 12-day mission to the International Space Station. Now, during this mission, they did put on the uh, International Space Station the second Russian module, Rosviet, or MRM-1. They also had three EVAs, or spacewalks, during this program. Now, why don't you join me in welcoming the crew of STS-132, please. Thanks, Michael. So this is, uh, has always been my favorite museum of any museum I've ever gone to in the world. And uh, Piers, I know that you have received a Nobel Prize before, <laughs> so that makes you famous, but I never thought I'd be in here talking. It's pretty cool. So we, uh, as Mike was saying, we just came back from space about seven weeks ago, and uh, we've all flown in space before. But uh, something that every astronaut realizes when you go into space is the absolute awesome privilege of the experience to get up there and have a vantage point looking back on the planet from 225 miles up with no atmosphere in the way where everything is crystal clear and high definition is something that truly changes your life. And with, with that privilege comes a responsibility and that responsibility is to share the experience. So we've been basically on the road almost every single day since we landed we had a couple of days to relax and try to get our sea legs, space legs back. But uh, we've been sharing the experience as best we can. And uh, what we're going to do today is we're going to show you a little video that kind of summarizes the mission from the beginning to the end. It's set to some pretty good music. And uh, so far, the, the video has been very well received. And uh, after that, we'll take some questions. Um, before I roll the video, I'm going to introduce the rest of the crew because they're pretty funny. Looking. <laughs> and, uh, and I'll also give you some of their nicknames, too. This is uh, Commander Dominic Antonelli, Commander of the United States Navy. <laughs> F-18 pilot, test pilot, spaceship pilot. Pretty cool stuff. We call him Tony. <laughs> and no applause for Tony. He doesn't deserve it. Dr. Garrett Reisman, we call him Big G. Can anyone figure out why? It's because he has such a big heart. He's a PhD in mechanical engineering, specializing in bubbles, and we still don't know what that means. Colonel Mike Good, US Air Force, just retired from the Air Force after a lot of years serving. <clears throat> bueno, as we call him, is airing next door in the uh, Hubble 3D movie because his last mission was fixing Hubble as little as a year and a half ago or less than that? 13 months. 13 months he was in space fixing the Hubble Space Telescope. I think that's pretty incredible. <laughs> Captain Steve Bowen, United States Navy, submarine driver. He's the only astronaut that was from the submarine force. And we think somewhere deep in NASA, somebody decided that if they could find somebody that liked to live inside of a steel tube and eat really bad food, they would make a perfect astronaut. <laughs> so these three guys right here are our spacewalkers. Uh, we did three spacewalks, two of them outside uh, at a time. So they each did two spacewalks. They did an absolutely tremendous job, and uh, that is really the bulk of the work involved in this mission up there. Dr. Pierce Sellers, I know you guys saw him a little bit earlier. He's the man uh, with the experience on the flight. This was his third flight. On his first two flights, he completed six spacewalks, so he's uh, definitely an accomplished spacewalker. And uh, you heard some of his other accomplishments. He's the all-around smart guy. And, uh, what I, what I like to tell people is uh, when you talk to kids to get their attention, 
there are three things that kids really, really like. They like dinosaurs, they like space exploration, and they like rock and roll. So our movie has space exploration and rock and roll, and we have a dinosaur. <laughs> <laughs> Every once in a while, I come up with a new one. <laughs> okay, without further ado, we're going to jump off the stage. We're going to roll this video, and then we'll uh, pop back up here for some questions. Thanks. Eight, go for main engine start. Six, five, four, three, two, one. And zero and liftoff of Space Shuttle Atlantis, reaching the crest of its historic achievements in space. And Houston Atlantis is in a roll. Roger, roll. Houston is now controlling. The roll maneuver is complete. Atlantis is in a head down position on course for a 51.6 degree, 136 by 36 statute mile orbit. And the three main engines on Atlantis have now been throttled down to 72% of rated thrust as the orbiter prepares to pass through the area of maximum dynamic pressure on the vehicle in the lower atmosphere. beginning to throttle back up. Atlantis, you are go at throttle up. Copy, go at throttle up.
for docking. Atlantis copies, go for docking, thank you. Houston and station capture confirmed. Atlantis uh, station, I say this reader, double up on the Yokoso and welcome to station. Copy station free drift. Thanks, Suichi. Space shuttle and lanterns for landing.
my friend. We've had a great time together. TJ will be home soon. Suichi will be home soon. It's all good. Houston and station from Atlantis. Physical separation. Space shuttle Atlantis departing. Speed now 320 miles per hour. The gear is down and locked. Main gear touchdown. Atlantis's nose being now rotated down toward the runway. The uh, chute being deployed. And nose gear touchdown. Space Shuttle Atlantis now comes home to the Kennedy Space Center for the final time. 25 years and more than 120 million miles traveled. The legacy of Atlantis now in the history books. How's the video? So that's what we do in space is we just kind of goof off all the time and yeah, not really. <laughs> we will now take some questions. I think you guys are all lined up and ready to go. What do you got? Um, hi, my name is Kendley Walker. I'm from the University of District of Columbia for the NASA Summer of Innovation Program. And my question is, what, is it, what does it take to be an astronaut? What does it take to be an astronaut? It's always scary when Tony answers this question. <laughs> I've got a really good answer, but they won't let me share it with you. So uh, it, it takes a, a lot of hard work in starting off in school and uh, doing your very best in school and then uh, figuring out what you want to be. Uh, maybe not completely when you grow up, but what you want to do after school. You got to find something you really like doing and you got to work hard and do your very best at it. So do your very best at school and then uh, find it something you like to do and do your very best at that. And then it's just a matter of uh, sending in an application and getting picked after that. Did do all right? Did good. Hi, my name is Marissa Renna from the University of District Columbia for the NASA Summer of Innovation. And my question is, what, it, what do you have, what is it like to live and work in this International Space Station. Okay, uh, I, I'll answer that question because uh, on my previous mission, I got to live up there for about three months. And uh, actually it was 95.2 days, which really bummed me out because you get a patch that you wear right up here if you're there for 100 days. But they said, oh no, you're 95.2, it doesn't count. That's why I signed up for this mission. I thought I'd put me over the top, but it didn't work. Anyway, <laughs> I'm, I'm not bitter. No, I'm not bitter. Uh, to, answer, to answer your question, though, it's amazing. Uh, when you're up there for about a month, uh, you reach what, what I like to remember as kind of like the golden period of my time up on the space station because you get used to 
I mean, completely used to being up in space to the point where you wake up every morning and it's totally normal for things to be floating around and for you to pop out of your sleeping bag, uh, go about your, you know, brushing your teeth and all that, uh, taking your, your, your water off the, off the wall and letting it float around and all that kind of stuff. Uh, it, it, it's, it's amazing on a day-to-day -day basis floating. And really when I say floating, I mean flying. Because as soon as you push off from a wall, you go shooting across the space station like you're, like you're Superman or something like that. So if you've had a dream where you can just put your arms out and fly, that's what it's like every day. And it's really magical. Hi, my name is Pauling Evisike, and I'm from the University of the District of Columbia Summer, Summer of Innovation Program. And my question is, what type of research did you conduct what, during your trip in orbit? OK. Um, well, we actually didn't get to do that much research on our mission because we were kind of a repair and uh, transport company for the space station this time. We took up a lot of stuff, we did a lot of repair work, and we picked up some stuff, the results of the research on space station that they wanted us to take home. What normally happens is the guys on space station do a whole lot of research up there on diseases, um, materials and stuff like that, and then they give the shuttle crew all these results to bring home for the scientists on the ground. So we got to handle it, but we didn't get to do that much. Um, Hi, my name is Savannah Parker. I am with the University of the District of Columbia Summer, NASA Summer of Innovation Program. And my question is, does microgravity have the same effect on both female and male? <laughs> you can answer the part you know. <laughs> I don't know. I know it has an effect on me. I mean, but uh, it must be the same because, you know, the female, male astronauts, we're all up there together and everybody seems to uh, adjust very well uh, over the same period of time. We've had long term flyers, male and female, and uh, I think everybody adjusts at some level fairly well, but I'm not the person to really answer that question. For, for long duration, there are slight differences in the anatomy, so the radiation uh, affects the women in, in slightly different ways than affects the men, and that's something our doctors take into account, but there are very minor differences, and there's no difference uh, between men and women as far as what you get to do in space and how long you can stay and all that. Thank you. Hi, my name is Walker Sess, and I'm from New Orleans, and my question is, Whenever you blasted off into space, was it like real scary? Was it like blasting off into space? You want to talk about your space thing? No, talk to me. Tell me Yeah, go ahead. Do your scary thing. So, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm getting the help with the answers here from uh, all these knuckleheads that are up here with me. <laughs> not sure how much of it to listen to. Um, I'm not a big fan of heights. So uh, it, <laughs> it turns out that uh, when you get in the elevator, you're about at ground level and, and that's all good. When you get out of the elevator, you're like 195 feet up and they're walking across open steel grating to get into the space shuttle. And uh, that's absolutely terrifying. <laughs> um, but once you get in, then it's, uh, then it, then it's okay. It's all good. The uh, Piers and Garrett here are the smart guys, and so they were probably terrified for the rest of the mission. Um, but I wasn't necessarily smart enough to be afraid of the rest. Um, that's probably good enough. We probably need more, more questions. My name is Alicia Twisselman, and I am from Orange County in California. And what would you recommend doing to try to get accepted by NASA into the space program? Yeah, well, we, we uh, talked about that a little bit earlier about what it takes to be an astronaut. Um, but if what you need to do right now is just uh, study hard in school. Uh, math and science are important, so uh, get interested in that and uh, do your best going through school. And then uh, 
get a job or, you know. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, get out of the house and get a job. <laughs> no, um, actually, get as much schooling as you can. Uh, after high school, college, advanced graduate degrees are, are great. Um, there's kind of two paths to be an astronaut. There's a military path and there's a civilian path, and we have both of them represented on this crew. You can be a military uh, pilot and a test pilot and uh, have that experience, or you can be a scientist um, and uh, one of the civilian scientists here, these guys with the 50-pound heads um, that are really smart guys, they've, uh, they've done that path. So, uh, But I think what uh, Commander Ham said earlier is, is find something and do something that you really enjoy doing so that while you're preparing to be an astronaut, you're having a great time. Is there an age limit to how old you have to be to, in order to enter the space program? How old do you have to be? Yeah, is there an age limit? I, I don't know that there's a minimum uh, requirement. You just have to have a, uh, a college degree in engineering or science. Yeah. <laughs> so get on it. Thank you. The uh, man in the Lake Elsinore storm hat. <laughs> My name is Austin Frisbee. I'm from Bankley, Mississippi. What did it feel like when you came back to Earth? I'm gonna try that, Garrett. You were from because you were up there the longest. Okay. Uh, so this time it wasn't so bad. We we're, were just up there about two weeks. Uh, last time I was up there, I think I mentioned this, 95.2 days. And uh, but I'm over that. I'm over that. Um, <laughs> so uh, that was different. Uh, that took a little longer to adjust. I remember that time when I came back, I took off my helmet right after we landed. And it felt like I was holding the anchor to the USS Nimitz in my hand. It felt so heavy. And I was like, oh, man, how am I ever going to brush my teeth again? I can't pick up the toothbrush, you know. But you get used to the weight of things pretty quickly. Uh, your sense of balance takes a little bit longer to come back because your brain has figured out to ignore your inner ear, which needs gravity to uh, work. And uh, so your brain has to remember to use that again. And then, uh, and then it takes a, even longer for your muscles. And the thing that takes the longest to come back is your bones. That could take up to a whole year to get your bone density back to where it was. So it's a long process of, of uh, readjusting, but it's amazing what the body can do. Yeah, uh, you actually grow, these guys are pointing out, you actually do grow about an inch up in, in uh, I grew about an inch when I was up in space. That's really the whole reason I signed up for the job. <laughs> But uh, it all goes away, unfortunately, when you come back. So what are you going to do? Next question. It's hard to imagine him an inch tall. My name is Raymond, and I'm from Galveston, Texas. And my question is, um, how big is the uh, space station? Is it, like, small or big? That's small. You got to pierce it. It's bigger than that. Um, <laughs> But it's actually, if you look up there at the, uh, at the model, um, from the one end of the solar rays to the other end of the solar rays, it's about the length of a football field. So it's pretty big. And then about the same going from this way down the, the living uh, areas. Um, it's about the size of a, maybe a, a big three-bedroom house, that much room inside. So there's quite a bit of room inside there. Yeah, one, each one of those uh, modules that you see there, the, the gray modules are about the size of a school bus. So it's a pretty big place. My name is Iori, and I'm from Japan four days ago. <laughs> what is most most important thing to do to be an astronaut? What's the uh, most important thing to do? Find something you like doing and have fun doing it. That is by far the most important thing. On my last mission, since you're from Japan, uh, we brought up that big looking school bus that's over on the right hand side. That's the Japanese experiment module. And we flew with uh, one of my dear friends, Aki Hoshide, who is a Japanese astronaut representing JAXA. And uh, we, built, we, we built the core of that whole complex out there that is the Japanese experiment module. Thank you. Nice hat. My name is Nicholas Baylor. I'm from Atlanta, Georgia. And I don't know 
And um, I want to know um, if you gained weight or lost weight. If you gain weight or lost weight, that's a good question. We, uh, I actually lost about 10 pounds on uh, both of my missions. Um, I'd say probably half of that was just water weight uh, that you lose. Uh, there's a fluid shift that happens when you get up there in space and there's no uh, gravity. And uh, so a lot of the fluid kind of goes up into your head and gets mixed up in your body. And uh, you end up getting rid of a lot of fluid toward the uh, beginning of the mission. And then when you come back to Earth, you're down a couple quarts. Um, and then also, I just don't think I ate as much as I normally did. Part of it's just being busy, and uh, part of it's just not feeling like eating so much. But uh, I'm back. I'm back to fight and wait. <laughs> so nothing you eat three months now. Yeah, I lost. So I lost about ten pounds, but I got it all back. I didn't. I didn't lose any weight. And the food's not all that good, but I'm not that picky of an eater. And probably part of the reason why Bueno lost weight was I was eating food out of his food locker. So. <laughs> Most of us do lose weight, though, and uh, so it's a great diet plan, and we're thinking about writing a book. Uh, <laughs> no, no. Yeah, so can you imagine, you go on a two-week vacation, you grow an inch and a half, and you lose 10 pounds. Who's with me? Yeah. All right. Yeah. My, yes, name, my name's Alexis. I'm from Grand Island, New York, and my question was, was it weird to get used to gravity when you got back to Earth? Yeah, Alexis, it, uh, it takes a little while for your brain to adjust and start uh, listening to the, all the little sensors that are going into your brain. Like right now, you have little sensors in the soles of your feet that are helping you balance, that are telling your brain which way to move your body to balance. When you're up in space, your brain is really, really smart, and it says, I don't need any of that information anymore, and it shuts it all off because you're floating around all the time. So when you come back, it has to retrain itself on how to listen to all the input it has. Good question. Caitlin Sainz, and I'm from Baltimore, Maryland. My question was, how far is the distance between the Earth and the Moon? Between the Earth and the Moon? We could do our demo. We could do the demo. Yeah, there's no Moon in here. I'll do it on the sides of the stage. This is, I'm going to give you a long answer. Imagine, if you will, right here, uh, this rail is the surface of the Earth. And imagine that rail over there is the Moon. If I'm the space station, do you think I'm sort of in the middle? You think I'm closer to the moon? Putting you on the spot here. Anybody can answer this. Or am I over here closer to Earth? Okay. Yes, in the back. Closer to the Earth. Closer to the Earth. That's exactly right. In fact, I'm probably right over here. And that's because, to answer your question, it's 250,000 miles to the moon. It's a quarter of a million miles. And in orbit, we're only 250 miles above the Earth. So we're 1,000th the distance to the moon. It's kind of amazing. Most people don't really understand that connection. Good question. Yes, sir. My, my name's Zachary. I'm from Alaska. Kansas. Kansas, whatever. <laughs> Is the moon dusty? <laughs> Is the moon dusty? I'm going to hand this microphone to Tony. He's from Mars, I mean, North Carolina. <laughs> <laughs> I've never been there, but I bet it's just as dusty as, as I mean, Kansas. <laughs> Pierce, have you been there? It's very dusty, um, from what I hear. and I'm from Duluth, Minnesota, and I'm wondering if you ever lost anything because it was like floating. We ever lost anything? Yeah. Um, do we ever Garrett turns out to not be all that big. I don't know if you can tell from where you're sitting, so you lose him all the time, but at least we found him before we got back. Yeah. I actually lost, um, I lost a pair of glasses on my first mission, and it was on uh, Atlantis, the space shuttle Atlantis. And I lost them after the first couple days of the mission. I took them off and I just let go of them because up in space you just let go of things and they'll just float right there. Um, it's bad when you come back to Earth. If you do that, then you break things. But um, up there you get used to it. So I took my glasses off. I let go of them. I looked over here and did something. I looked back and they were gone. And, uh, and I looked around for them for a while. I had my friends helping me and we never did find these glasses. And uh, 
So we got back home and I told NASA, I said, hey, I lost these glasses. You might want to look around for them. And uh, they looked around and didn't find them. And, they, and the space shuttle Atlantis flew again um, on the next mission. And when it came back from that mission, they were cleaning some filters up um, underneath the dashboard there behind the displays. It was actually right before we flew Atlantis again. So right before we launched, they found my glasses up at, in this filter. And they gave them back to me. And so I have them uh, back again. Yeah, they've flown more times in space than I have. My name is John, and I'm from Kansas, and uh, did it take a long time to get up into space? Did it take a long time? No. It took precisely 8 minutes and 23 seconds. That's how long the rockets burn. And you got to understand that when you lift off from Earth, you have over 7 million pounds of thrust pushing you up into space. So it pushes you really, really fast, really, really fast. So eight minutes and 23 seconds, you are in space, zero gravity, on your way, trying to chase down the International Space Station. Uh, hi, my name is Grayson. I'm from Bethesda. And I wanted to know, um, when you're coming in for re-entry, uh, does the cockpit heat up? I was looking, looking where? Pierce is telling me where I was looking. So uh, we, Hawk is our commander, he's our boss. So we get one thermostat in the whole space shuttle and it's by where he sits and sleeps. So he decides what temperature it is. So the night before we come back, yeah, he left it colder, which I thought was pretty good. These guys seem to be continuing to whine about it. I thought they were over that, but it, I guess not. Um, <laughs> So you, the night before, you make it uh, as cold inside there as you can because you know it's going to get warm. And also, we landed in Florida in the middle of May or near the end of May. And I don't know if you've been to Florida at the end of May, but it kind of gets warm there too, even if you haven't gone through reentry. So we try to make it as, uh, as cold as we can before we go. And then outside, uh, you could see that you were riding through the inside of a fireball. The windows were orange, orangish pink and plasma was coming off, rolling off the back of the space shuttle. So it was really, really hot outside and uh, not too bad inside. I'm Willie and I'm from Sh Chicago, Illinois. I wanna know how much gallons does it take for you to take the space shuttle into space? You see the orange? tank up there on the space shuttle? Yeah. We fill that up. And I'm going to guess it's about a half a million gallons. Let me try hey, Willie, that, uh, that whole thing sitting there, that whole space shuttle sitting on the pad, weighs four and a half million pounds. So it's big. The part that goes into space, just the, the bit with the wings there, the actual space shuttle kind of thing, the orbiter, that only weighs a quarter of a million pounds. So all the rest of that, four and a quarter million pounds is essentially all rocket fuel. So it's an awful lot. Good question. Hi, I'm Angela Rubin from Rochester, New York, and I wanted to know if it is hard to sleep on the International Space Station. Epi. Yeah, well, some people find it really easy to sleep, but they're the people who are asleep during lectures and things like that. Um, I find it really hard the first few days to sleep. What you do is when you get into your sleeping bag at night and you put your little eye cover on and you close your eyes, you feel, or I feel, like you just stepped off a 10-story building and you're falling. And you watch people trying to sleep and they go like this. <laughs> they kind of wake up, you know? <laughs> and um, so we do various tricks. We kind of tie ourselves to the walls with bungees so you feel like you're in bed at home and a mattress. But after a while, you kind of get used to it and, you know, sleep upside down like a bat if you want to and uh, just float around. It takes a while to get used to it, though. Not for him. <laughs> My name's Arabella. Ask how many, are there more boys or more girls in the astronaut? Is there more boys or girls? Don't 
Well, it, it looks like there's more boys than girls, <laughs> as far as I can see. <laughs> um, but it doesn't, uh, let's see, up on the space station right now, there's six people, and there's four boys and two girls. Uh, on our, on our uh, space shuttle flight, there was six boys, so it just depends. Yeah, and there was one girl up on the space station. When, when we were there, there was one girl. We had her outnumbered, 11 to 1. <laughs> Philippa from Wales in the UK, and I was just wondering, how often do um, missions get sent up to um, repair or add stuff to the space center? Is that a country? I handle the uh, British end of things. Um, you might understand them, though. That's right. That's how we speak the same language. Yeah. Uh, really about shuttle missions, four to six a year. Sometimes, you know, I think seven is a recent record. Um, and we've been doing pretty well, actually, the last year in getting missions to and fro to shuttle finish, uh, station, finishing off the build of station. And that's going to go on through the end of this year, two, two more flights, maybe a third, and then that's the end of the shuttle program. What part of Wales are you from? Um, Cardiff. We, were, we gave a presentation in Cardiff two and a half weeks ago or so. We were just over there. Third row, right? Yes, sir. Hi, my name is Matthew. I'm from Grand Island, New York. And I was just wondering, on your way up into space, does it hurt your ears? Man, that's a good question. Yeah, yeah it does. Because I don't know if you heard in the video on the icon, but he was going, woo-hoo, like the whole way up. That kind of hurt my ears. <laughs> uh, but no, there's no pressure change inside, so you don't, your ears don't pop. This, the ship stays about the same. And uh, it is a little noisy inside, but you have a helmet on and earmuffs uh, for uh, your headset. So um, it's, not, it's not so noisy that it hurts. Good question. <laughs> earmuffs. <laughs> Taylor from Duluth, Georgia. And I was wondering if... You're going to have to get closer. Okay. I was wondering if um, Earth is warmer than space. If Earth is what? Warmer than space. Uh, no, I can, yeah. Lots. Well, oh. Ah, that's a good point, the connector. We're, as you can see, we give each other advice on how to answer questions. Some of it's better than others. You know, Piers' advice is, yes, absolutely. I and mean, he says, talk about the connector. So we'll talk about the connector. But uh, actually, it's really interesting. When you go outside and you're doing a spacewalk, when the sun goes down, which it does every... 90 minutes, because you're 90 minutes around the world. So, yeah, it's like they say, there's a lot of nights every day. Every 24-hour period, you get 16 sunrises and sunsets. But when the sun goes down, it can get to about minus 200 degrees on the things that are exposed. You know, there's no real way to measure temperature if, you, if you're not transferring it. So if you put, put your hand on it, you'd sense that it was minus 200. But when the sun's up, it's about plus 200 degrees. And actually, Garrett and I were outside on the first DVA, and we were having difficulty putting this connector into place. And uh, Garrett, being the really smart guy, said, hey, the sun's coming up. Why don't I shield the connector until the sun heats up the piece we were going to connect it to? And so we waited for a while. And sure enough, it had, uh, it had not expanded, and we were able to make the connector. And you saw that in the movie when we uh, kind of gave each other the high five, because that temperature change, that 400 degrees temperature change allowed the materials to fit more better. More better? All right. Thank you. Oh, there you go. There you go. Yeah, so. Hi, I'm Katrin from the Netherlands, and I have a question. What's the most um, interesting you did in space? What, the most interesting thing you did in space? Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> I ain't answering that. <laughs> <laughs> Piers, you can answer this. I, yeah. <laughs> hey, well, there's a number of things that we can talk about. Um, I think everyone says two, two things are really great. One is floating around, just being able to float around, swim in the air, zoom up and down the space station, you know, like a little fish. It's a, a lot of fun. And the other thing is the view. 
Uh, we have this big glass bubble under the bottom of the space station. You can stick your head in there and look at the world go by. And you know, you go once around the world in an hour and a half. It's just the most beautiful view. So both of those things are pretty interesting. Can I add one? Go ahead. Playing, playing with your food. It never, ever, ever gets old. <laughs> I bet after 95.2 days in space, it was still fun. Hi, I'm Annika from Arizona. I just want to know how long you guys have been astronauts. How long we've been astronauts? Uh, the dinosaur, yeah, since the Earth cooled. <laughs> Yeah, he was here in 96, I was in 98, Garrett was 98, and the other three guys are in 2000. So in the ball, 10 to 14 years, somewhere in there. Uh -oh. oh, no. <laughs> Who are you? Um, I'm Michael Antonelli from Houston, Texas. What's your favorite part of the ISS? That's, almost, that's like a new uh, question. It's easy. I'll, I'll give you mine. It's the cupola. I don't know if you guys can see it, but on this model over there, sort of over on the right-hand side, there's a little glass, kind of a dome, window dome that hangs down underneath. That, by far, for me, is the coolest place to go. You go float over there, stick your head down there, and you can see the entire horizon of the Earth all at once, just kind of rolling by underneath you. Anybody else? I think that's probably everybody's answer. Good question, though. You're invited back. I'm, I'm Stephen Gannon from Dallas, Fort Worth, Texas. And uh, out of all the training that you've done with NASA, what's one thing once you went up that you did not anticipate? That you're like, oh my gosh, wow. I got an answer. I, I got really short, though. So. <laughs> Actually, the thing that surprised me the most is how little things surprised me because the training was really so good. The first time I went to orbit, I was really shocked that things actually happened the way people said they were happening. If you spend a lot of time talking to other astronauts that flew in space, you know, they tell you about food floating. I mean, it's really cool and just amazing, but you kind of knew it was going to come, you know? And that's the thing that was totally shocking is how little there was that was shocking. And uh, at least for me, that was the amazing thing. The training is that good. Yeah, and that's true. Uh, I got one visual kind of thing that was from my first flight, and it was uh, probably about 10 minutes after liftoff, maybe a little bit, 15 minutes or so. After the engines uh, uh, are quit there, you get rid of the external tank, you do a little flip kind of a maneuver, and in that flip, uh, we flew into night, and I was sitting in the pilot seat, which is a great view out the front, and the nose was coming back down through the earth, and I was looking down at some lights of a city in Spain and saw a shooting star go below me. And I had never thought of the fact that shooting stars are now going to be below you when you're in space. So that was my, my holy cow moment of, wow, I'm in space. <laughs> okay, we have, we have one last question. All righty. Yeah, we, we did a lot of listening to Pink Floyd in space. <laughs> <clears throat> um, if, uh, let's see, is the training that you do for weightlessness the same as it is in space? So, uh, the, the, so the question was, is the training that we do for, uh, for weightlessness uh, the same as it is in space? And, and mostly I can answer that with regard to spacewalking because uh, we train in a, in a giant pool uh, where we float around in that pool and, and uh, practice our spacewalking. The, 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 the way, best way I can describe it is it, it is perfectly adequate to, to do our job because when you get to the work site, and you know you see the bolts you're supposed to turn and the connector you're supposed to plug in. It looks just like it does in the pool and just like the pictures and the real hardware that you played with. And we also have virtual reality labs where we put it all together. And all of that prepares you very well when you're doing your job. What it doesn't prepare you well for though is when you look over your shoulder and you see the entire east coast of the United States go flying on by. <laughs> and so the way I describe it is it's a strange mix of the familiar and the completely outlandish. And uh, so, yes and no. All righty, folks, let's hear it for the crew of STS-132.
I think that was probably the best music video I've seen in a while. <laughs> All right, that's our show for today. I appreciate you coming to the Moving Beyond Earth Gallery at the National Air and Space Museum. As I indicated earlier, the gallery will close for a time being while we break down, but please come back and visit the gallery at 1 p.m. Thank you so much. <laughs>